From the California State Senate, this is Senate Spotlight. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this segment of Senate Spotlight, where we discuss legislative priorities and policy and other related issues with members of the California State Senate. From the state capitol here in Sacramento, I'm Brian Green, and our subject this time around is accessory dwelling units, ADUs, or granny flats, as you may know them. They are those small backyard housing units that, among other advantages, present this small but very mighty solution to the housing crisis in a lot of cities, those cities that are desperate for density and cheaper housing alternatives. Recent state laws have provided a jump start for the construction of ADUs by removing local ordinance barriers to their creation. But as small as ADUs can be, they're still big enough to be embroiled in red tape and fee mandates and caught in the middle of other housing-related debates about neighborhood character and homely, homelessness and NIMBYism. So we're going to talk about ADUs in this segment and the new legislation that can make them cheaper to build and a less burdensome process to get them built. Joining us this time around is our state senator from Fremont, Bob Wykowski. He is chair of the Senate Committee on Environmental Quality and the chair of the Senate Budget Subcommittee on Resources. He's also the author of a couple of those bills that uh, made life as we know today for ADUs and granny flats. Welcome. Well, Good thank to you have for you having here. me, Brian. Thank Good you. Good to see you. And then Matt Regan, who is the senior vice president of public policy for the Bay Area Council, a business sponsored public policy advocacy organization for the nine counties that make up the Bay Area. Matt, welcome. Thank Good you, Brian. Good to be here. So, gentlemen, let me start with you, Senator, since you're the, uh, the author of a lot of this legislation. Just a quick primer, very quick, on ADUs and how you, as both a former elected official in the East Bay and, and also a current state lawmaker, came to be such an advocate for them, kind of this pint-sized solution for California's housing crisis and uh, these areas where, uh, you know, where single-family homes are really at, at, at a at a premium, it, it creates such an advantage. So let's just get set that scene. Well, you know, start part of it starts off with everybody knows somebody that has an unpermitted garage and on their block that's now got somebody living in it. But most people don't know anybody who actually went through the permit process and has a legal accessory dwelling in, on their house. And when I was in the city council in Fremont, we would go through our housing element and uh, look at how many secondary units were uh, passed. Because the legislature, this is not the first look, the legislature said that cities had to pass legislation to encourage or, you know, coordinate the construction. And what you were finding is that nobody was building any accessory dwelling units, no permanents. I mean, city of Fremont's got 230 some odd people. They had one maybe two, and you're saying, what was the barriers that, that folks could get in? So the philosophy was simply return the control back to the homeowner. Take away some of the onerous barriers that cities had put in, the setbacks that they had, the requirements that you build parking or you have parking provided on the lot, and just give the homeowner that flexibility that if they wanted to build an accessory dwelling unit, they could build one. And I guess we've seen that. Fast forward here a couple of years since you've authored some of these pieces of legislation to, to pave the way. We've seen sort of a proliferation in cities large and small here in California, right? Yeah. They, I mean, Los Angeles went from 60 permits in 2016 when we passed the bill to two, over 2,000 permits. So it's, you know, some crazy uh, increase. And uh, statewide, we've seen about a 36 percent increase is the numbers that people are using just in from 2016 to 2017. So the public is very interested in it. I've gone to two or three, um, um, you know, workshops with folks, and I'm surprised and 300 people show up in Santa Barbara that want to know what's the law, how, what are the, it, and they explain some of the barriers that still exist or that they're finding with their local uh, jurisdictions. And speaking of local jurisdictions, Matt, of course you deal with local jurisdictions here uh, in the Bay Area. Yep. Obviously you've seen this firsthand uh, on the ground of uh, this proliferation and popularity, right, of these uh, ADUs? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as the Senator said, um, most people have one of these in their neighborhood, they just don't know it's there. And you reminded us that fun lived above the house in the Cunninghams other day. So yeah. let's see. We, we <laughs> Arthur Fonzarelli was the original accessory dwelling unit inhabitant. Um, but yeah, so they, they do exist. They're there. Um, they're gentle density, as we call it, gentle infill. Um, most of the Bay Area's uh, zoned residential land is zoned for single-family homes. And if we're to really solve this housing crisis problem, we have to find a way to put more people into those neighborhoods. Um, you know, California has... 
um, fewer homes per capita than in any state, but we have more empty bedrooms per capita than any state other than Utah. So we're really not utilizing our existing built uh, uh, landscape. Accessory dwelling units are a great way to put more people into those neighborhoods and not increase the capacity that the neighborhoods were originally designed for, but just to get them up to that capacity. Um, we have a lot of empty nesters living in big homes, and for a number of reasons, they're just not able to sell those homes. They may be sort of house-rich, cash-poor. Uh, and uh, this accessory dwelling units give them an opportunity to monetize some of that asset, create a revenue stream uh, every month by building an accessory dwelling unit, and at the same time, create much needed new housing in their, in their community. And really housing for the workforce, really, exactly. is what it comes down to, right? Yeah. These accessory dwelling units, because they're smaller, because they're, you're living in a semi-shared um, uh, living arrangement, um, they tend to rent for considerably less than a typical comparable sized apartment in that community. So they are affordable by design. And, and even as a, a solution, if you will, to, to some degree to the homeless issue, homelessness issue, that can even be used to Section 8 housing, depending on the permitting process and everything, right? Right. And that's and, and we give some flexibility to the cities. I mean, the cities, each city is, is in a different position. You know, some cities have an aggressive um, uh, homeless uh, uh, policy or program where they're taking people, but there's rules. They give them other services that they have other than just slap them into somebody's ADU. They they go through counseling. They learn how to uh, do a job application. They they get re-prepared um, to go into the community. And that's an, an obvious, if you look at the uh, stream, that they go from uh, possibilities of just placement, as you would have from affordable housing advocates also. So as you have authored these pieces of legislation, the governor had signed them, and you're starting to see the proliferation of ADUs in communities. You're also seeing sort of, a, to some degree, a proliferation of, of uh, sort of resistance, uh, some disincentives and deterrence from the local governments. And, and as a legislator as, and as a former uh, local elected official, was this frustrating to you to see s some of this pushback? Well, I mean, I knew that there was push pushback uh, at the beginning. I mean, in 2016, I didn't have any friends other than the Bay Council. I mean, nobody, <laughs> nobody was saying this is we want to do ADUs now. Now, by you know, again, we changed the wording. We said they're accessory dwelling units to the house, so that's how we get over the hump. Where this is still the mother house that goes on. Um, I, it makes sense. We've required, you know, one of the things that the bills did is that it said if you have a local ordinance, if it doesn't comply with state law, it's completely wiped out. And that obviously gets local jurisdictions mad. So they've come back on a second uh, look and have tried to put on, you know, restrictions like a covenant. You have to put a, re a deed restriction on your land and let it know, let people know that you have an ADU. That is really, you know, a little over the top, but it makes people nervous. So some people in Santa Barbara are suing over over mm -hmm. that. Um, and the fees, you know, the, what happens is that it's a smorgasbord of different fees that people have, uh, uh, the cities have out there, and whether they're charging you for the current recreation or the future rec recreation or the school or the water district, everybody has these impact fees is what we call that, which mm -hmm. makes the price of housing very high in California because, uh, I mean, I, I could defend the cities because they can't raise their parcel tax because of Prop 13, so they're saying, well, every new house gets built has to pay for uh, all these, these services, so you're, we're in an odd situation. But I, I go back to the cities, and I said, well, if you have 200,000 units that are unpermitted in the state of California, you got zero money. You got zero impact fees, and you get zero assessments on the houses. So that's the, that's the current problem that they're not addressing. And even school fees, right? You have yes. some folks, even for folks that, who are uh, renting these units, but there's no children involved, they're still obliged to pay the school fees. Right, right. And the, and the, you know, the, the school districts are, you know, they're scraping for money. They don't have enough money. They're having bake sales, for God's sakes, to try to get people to get some money. So they look at this impact fee as somebody presented it to them, as planners have presented to city councils, and say, here's a way that we can get money when the, the, the new people are coming in here. Again, think about it. I'm a resident, and these are the new people coming in. Make them pay more. So that's just fundamentally not fair in my eyes. And Matt, what's your perspective on that when you see these uh, the local pushback from the cities and counties who are coming up with everything from fees to the code requirements to make it uh, so difficult to establish one of these ADUs? As the Senator said, I mean, local governments are in a real pinch um, to pay the bills, and we have sympathy for them. And, and But um, I think we've reached a tipping point where we've got to really look uh, long and hard at how we fund local government, and I think 
you know, taxing hou housing to pay for all of society's needs has led us to this point where, you know, we have this intense affordability crisis. The last person in the door pays for everything. And you mentioned it yourself, Brian. I mean, if you look at a, you know, a studio accessory dwelling unit in a backyard, a backyard cottage, that, you know, that no child is ever going to live in that unit. It's designed for adults. If it's a studio, you know, there's no children living space in it. But, you know, in many jurisdictions, that, uh, that unit is still obligated to pay school fees. That's fundamentally unfair. Uh, so, you know, from our perspective, we need to remove as many barriers as possible to the construction of these units. And um, if they are accessory to the original single-family home, if they are access, that home has already paid its fees. And if this is just a, an additional use on that parcel, then you would have to argue that the fees have been paid and that no additional assessments are, 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 are just. And then you have attitudes from neighbors. You have the, the nimbyism, the, the folks that, that will create problems in, say, in wealthy neighborhoods to avoid seeing one of these type of uh, dwelling units come up. Right. And, 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 you know, I mean, the NIMBY people have many shapes and sizes and colors that, that, that they go in. Um, you know, the par part of it is, as Brian alluded to, this is almost an invisible uh, increase of density in your na in neighborhood. I mean, a lot of people are going to say, I don't want that garage converter. I don't want that somebody in my neighbor's backyard. I mean, I can't stop neighbors going to city councils and doing it. But if you look at, if you look at the fact that there's 200,000 units right now throughout the state that are not, are off the grid, you could probably put another 800,000 in, 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 the, in the neighborhoods and not really feel the impact. I mean, yeah, there could be in any particular street an impact with, uh, with the uh, the housing, but or with the parking, but I would argue that if people are getting supplemental income from that, or they're providing housing to a family member, remember a lot of this is just an extended family member that doesn't want to move in with mom and dad or grandma and grandpa, but have their own own place. They may not be even charging rent uh, for those folks. So I, I think the it enriches the cities and the towns throughout the state of California. All right, you have a piece of legislation uh, that's kind of come to the rescue here, uh, uh, circa 2018, SB 831, that will do a number of things to help make it cheaper and easier to build the new units, cut the impact fees, et cetera. Tell us about AB 830, SB 831. Well, first, it just it eliminates the impact fees. And we're saying for, when you're going to construct or convert part of your part of your existing home, you don't pay any impact fees. We're going to do that. We set up an amnesty program for 10 years. We give all the people who have unpermitted uh, units, they can come, they have 10 years to sort of bring them up to code. As long as the uh, city planner or city officials say it's it, it's safe, um, they, they can do that. We get rid of the owner-occupied. You know, we're saying if build the units, because they don't want, if I put one in my unit, my house, and then I want to move to a vacation home or move away for a job, I got to sell the house. We want to get rid of that. Um, we have no height requirements. We have uh, the idea where uh, the state housing uh, community development department is going to be able to look at the ordinances that cities are promulgating and correct them and say, this is, this is not in compliance with what state law is. And, you know, squeeze down the, the, um, Set a, setbacks to three feet, which is normally what it is, and and get these permits approved. You know, it, it's this is not rocket scientists. We want people that want to build these things, let them build it now, and answer that cry for workforce housing or, um, mm -hmm. you know, housing the housing crisis. We need to do something. Well, I've sensed a lot of frustration here as you bring this bill forward. That you you have described this uh, in some stories that I've read as kind of a, a round three of mm -hmm. this battle with local governments. So I sense a lot of frustration as you deal with this. Right, and, and I mean, I, and I don't. I don't want to really battle local government because they want to they want to say that they they should have the final say on what these what these units are and what I'm doing is I'm saying well no let the homeowner have the final say but remember part of this is that when you build this new permanent unit it gets assessed by the county assessor you know instantaneously if we had all 200,000 units cities and school districts would receive more money not a boatload of money but more money because now they have this living unit these 200,000 units there if we build another 400 or 800 more units then that's going to get assessed not the whole house but that that new unit that's in the backyard and that's a tax increment but you do a lot of this invisibly throughout the state and the and the cities are enriched and they're more balanced and that, uh, as the ink dries here on uh, SB 831, what is some of the reaction that you're hearing from the local governments in the Bay Area? Well, again, local governments, as I said earlier, um, um, do have concerns about additional uh, sort of state mandates being uh, piled upon them. But at the end of the day, 
um, we have a housing crisis and it demands a crisis response. So things have to change. We can't keep doing what we've been doing for the last generation and expect some miraculous uh, supply of new housing to, to emerge. So this is certainly one uh, uh, we discussed earlier. Is it a panacea? Is it a silver bullet? Um, no, but it's certainly a, a, an important piece uh, of the solution to this housing crisis. We need to do a lot of different things, but this is a really important thing. Um, it doesn't require any public funding. It, uh, it, it, we're turning essentially uh, millions of California homeowners into mini developers. So it's, it's, you know, we're creating a lot of new opportunity. Um, and if you look at the Bay Area as an example, we've one and a half million single family homes in the Bay Area. Um, if just 10% of those homes built an accessory dwelling unit, 150,000 new homes would, for all intents and purposes, solve a lot of our housing problems in the region, our, our, our supply problems. And by way of example, Vancouver, uh, British mm -hmm. Columbia, yes. similar housing market. Uh, they're kind of like the gold standard for ADUs. Yes. Over a third of single-family homes in Vancouver, British Columbia, have an accessory dwelling unit. They've been doing this for 20-plus years. If they we, had the similar challenges, but the local governments folks they supported were, they it. They were very aggressive on accessory dwelling units. They yeah. actually mandate that all new home construction must be designed in a way that at a future date can be converted into an accessory dwelling unit, the garage or a downstairs basement. Um, so they're that, they've, they're that far advanced in the terms of accessory dwelling units. They see it as their, you know, their, their single biggest supply of affordable housing. Senator, how have your other colleagues uh, reacted to this as it's moved through? The ones who have really, uh, really been knee deep in this challenge of affordable housing. Well, now I have some friends. Now I have some friends <laughs> that, that, and it's interesting. It, People are excited about it. You uh -huh. know, there's not many things we do here in Sacramento that people are, are genuinely excited about it because it's good for them, or they think that it's good for their 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 kids, or somebody wants to buy a house and they're saying, "I'll go to Fannie Mae and I want to include that rental income. I'll put a second unit because I don't need the four thousand. There's all these different variables as our housing stock is is uh, is different. So I actually have some people that are you know supporting it and and they're getting feedback from their uh, local. Uh, citizens that are saying we like this we want to be able to do it and but I still can't pay the forty three thousand dollars impact fees that the city has you make that go away and I will build it Wow yeah. well I, I've, re I've read stories that, that that ADUs really are not necessarily always the easiest way to add affordable housing that it may be more expensive than some people think it would particularly in whether it's a, a high a high real estate market or a cheaper market high real estate market may be more affordable like say San Francisco and a cheaper market say Modesto might be more expensive. Is there legitimacy to that argument? Well, I've yeah, well, I mean, construction costs are construction costs. I mean, I think there's definitely um, in in uh, uh, a market like San Francisco or the East Bay where you can probably you know command two thousand dollars plus a month for an accessory dwelling unit. You can make the, your construction cost back again if we can take care of the the impact fee problem. Uh, we're looking at returns on investment of uh, you know seven to eight years. Um, that's in anybody's book that's a good investment and then after that it's cash in the bank um, obviously in different rental markets it'll be a longer term uh, return but at the end of the day I mean I think for for anybody to look at this I, I, I compare it to, to residential rooftop solar in the early days of the residential rooftop solar business the early adopters were the environmental community who didn't really care if they made money back you know they, but as soon as the, the the scales tipped and it became an economic uh, you know, advantage to put r rooftop solar, it exploded. Once we get ADUs to that point where we can get the returns on investment to a, to a, a manageable number, um, we're going to see a real a real explosion of, the, of construction of these. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we're seeing we're seeing some builders. Some people are coming up with kits so that they can tell you right now on a computer program. You can go in and show them your lot, and they could say what they could build, what it would look like, what it would cost. That'll take you five minutes. There's builders, small builders that are going together that now are looking at it and saying, you know, if I build one, it probably won't make any money, but if I do 10 or I do 12, then I can, you know, help these folks around. Architects obviously are interested in it. The real estate mark, uh, folks are interested too because now they have a different product or somebody who might be looking to buy but can't afford, but if they could get the income off of a accessory dwelling unit with relatively cheap investment. So it's 
it's exciting, I guess. And I know you still have some growing pains here as we wrap up, just uh, just a final thought. Still some growing pains uh, in this process, in the incentive process for local governments, and hopefully uh, SBA 31 will help with that, right? Right. I mean, you know, I, I would imagine that nobody wants to take on the amnesty program. Uh, the cities haven't done it, so I've, I've gone full full board on it and, and put down giving giving people an opportunity to to become permanent and make the changes if they need to, to do it over over time so you're not scaring people because these, there's a lot of people who have made these changes 30, 40 years ago and just have that that information, that the information that people are going to have that this is available and the markets change, right? You know, we have, in my area, we have a BART extension going down to San Jose. All of a sudden, those neighborhoods, those single-family homes, if you can get on BART, you can be in Hayward in 20 minutes where you work. All of a sudden, you don't want to spend twice as much for one in, uh, in Hayward. So all that, all that gets worked out. It's exciting. And so really, Matt, just as your final parting shot here, growing pains, it's understandable, but you, like you say, the, the time that, that's uh, given to invest in it, it makes it more than worthwhile anyway, right? Yeah, essentially what we've done, and, and when 831 gets passed and signed, we, we will have essentially created a whole new asset class of housing. And um, it's going to take sort of the entrepreneurial community and, and the community at large a little lag time to catch up to realize what has actually been created here. There's an awful lot of activity in the entrepreneurial community right now. I, I meet with them regularly, people with different ideas and what types of, of, of uh, rental share, uh, sort of equity share. There's even one entrepreneur I met with last week who's planning to build 100, 150 accessory dwelling units and then renting them to homeowners on portable foundations. And if you don't like the idea after a few years, you can have it removed. So there's a whole swathe of, of new ideas that are coming online, and I think it's, it's a very exciting period, and I think we're going to see a lot of these units in California in our lifetime. Great. Senator, hope we can have you back, too, to get an update on SBA 31 as we go through the process and hopefully see a little less of a hassle with uh, the ADUs in the local cities and counties. So thank, thank you very much. Senator Bob Wykowski is uh, one of our guests uh, from Fremont and also Matt Regan, who is the Senior Vice President of Public Policy for the Bay Area Council. And that is it for this edition of Senate Spotlight. We invite you to join us next time around as we discuss important legislative issues and policy with the newsmakers and the newsbreakers of the California State Senate. From the State Capitol here in Sacramento, I'm Brian Green. Thanks for watching.